that's by the time you're 50. If you're 40 now, that's by the time you're 70. It's the kind of horizon over which people plan their financial futures. It's the kind of horizon over which you might get something like a mortgage. So let me give you an example of something which is changing in a semi-predictable way right now, which is the price of solar panels. Solar panels have fallen in price by 7% a year every year for the last 40 years. So on the order of every decade, the price of solar panels halves. 30 years out, you can rationally expect the price of solar panels to be less than a tenth of what it is now, and as a result, the entire global energy landscape will change. Energy relates to every single economic process we have. It gets deep inside of the structure of things like Bitcoin because of the ratio of costs. It is an absolutely ubiquitous part of human life. So when you hear people talking about 10, 15, 20 year projections forward, um, Great. When you hear people talk about 20, 20, 30 year projections forward, and they don't talk about the exponential fall in energy prices, they're living in a fantasy land. There's just no such place. Um, let me show you a thing. Right. So the yellow cable that I have around my keys is a material called spectra. Everybody see that? So spectra is a nanomaterial. The breaking strain of that piece of string is in excess of 400 kilograms, right? And sometimes I demonstrate this by having people try and pull on it in teams, four or five people on each side holding on a piece of wood tied to the spectra. The stuff will cut into the wood half an inch. And it's 40p a meter on Amazon. It's just dirt cheap. And it's made of freaking polypropylene. Right? Long chain carbon atoms sheathed in hydrogen actually aligned with the direction of your forces. So you look out 30 years, this stuff is going to be everywhere. They're spinning it into clothes. Levi's make jeans which are laced through with spectra today. You can buy them for about 80 quid a pair. So you go forward 10 years, ubiquitous use of nanomaterials in clothing, ubiquitous use of nanomaterials in construction. You go forward 20 years, you begin to see an environment where solar power is substantially cheaper than any other kind of power available. You go forward 30 years, nanotechnology, biotechnology, replicator engineering, likely to be routine parts of life. Now, if you're a big player, if you're a hedge fund manager, if you're a regulator, if you are the state, you're responsible for making plans 30 years forward. If you're an individual and you're looking at this kind of world where you're trying to plan your future, you're responsible for thinking 30 years forward. And into this context, you then place Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a ripple on an incredibly rapidly accelerating front of technological change. Right? It's not a final solution. It's going to have successors. The successors will solve other problems. It might become a standard that lives a really long time, like the internet or the web. Or it might roll over extremely quickly. There's no way to know. But this is what we mean when we start talking about the future. It's not two years out, it's not five years out, it's 15, 20, 30 years forward you have to be thinking. So, let's assume that Bitcoin continues to adapt because it builds a governance structure that allows it to continue to change relative to the challenges it faces. That means that you continue to modify the standards, it means that you continue to modify the code base, it means that you try and not break the system of value that you've created, because that would be the equivalent of a violent revolution, because people's property rights would get broken. Inside of that structure, the only way that you survive into the future is by constant adaptation to the circumstances. If you don't adapt, you don't get to be part of the future, and we know that. Even theoretically stable standards like Visa are constantly mutating to handle the evolutionary environment which they embed. So, in the process of that adaptation, the primary reason for adapting is conflicts that you might lose. Conflict number one, regulators. Conflict number two, competitors. Conflict number three, traditional whole stores of value which refuse to cooperate with the Bitcoin system. For example, you wind up with laws which will not allow you to buy land in Bitcoin. There could be all kinds of structures which come into play to prevent Bitcoin moving forward, and it's the ability to adapt to that onrush of change that right, defines whether or not you survive. Right now, Bitcoin is in a position where its mechanisms for adaptation are vastly weaker than its adoption curve. Far more people are coming on board with far more intensity and far more interest and far more money than the governance structures which manage the standards, 
And if you centralize the governance structures, you're going to get people like evil. So, how do you decide how to move forward in a complex environment? Given how difficult big structures are to navigate for above ground, fully visible, ordinary institutions, given that the time that you typically spend in the Fortune 1000 is only seven years, right? companies rise and they fall again, how do you build the adaptive capacity into the governance structures around Bitcoin such that it has a long-term future? The environment is complex, we're going through a period of unprecedented discontinuous change, through that, you have to take this enormous pool of value. What are we up to now? 12 or 15 billion dollars in small, right? Larger than many large corporations, larger than many countries. How do you steer that, given that it's by nature decentralized? And I don't have an answer for that, but I know that it's absolutely critical that the Bitcoin community begins to talk about governance and begins to talk about risk management in a completely proactive way, because the first time you hit a serious challenge, if the system cannot turn relatively quickly to adapt, you're going to get creamed in the same way the ego did. Survival means adaptation, and adaptation means governance capacity. So, um, other targets that might come up. Wealth transfer. For the first time in my life, the people that I know that are doing radical politics are rich. That has never happened before. Whether it was the anarchists, whether it was the Greens, whether it was the left, even the libertarians, for the very most part, were dirt poor. Right? You step outside of the ordinary political economy and your values, and you become rapidly unemployed. And we all know this. So for the first time, I have seen an actual economic model for people who consider themselves to be activists, which is building out an alternative economy. Um, in the 1960s, one of the most uh, prescient criticisms of the New West, the revolutionary movement in America, was that they did not have an economic model. They put all of their energy into resisting the state, and as a result, all they got was beaten up, and at the end of it, they had no new institutions. The need to build alternative institutions is always seen as a core part of the revolutionary and radical agenda, and Bitcoin is by far the most effective alternative institution in terms of feeding the people that build it that has ever come out of an alternative political structure, possibly since the invention of communism. Right? State communism. So what we have is a genuine breakthrough in the core structures. Yeah, I'm trying, otherwise we, but the problem is we get the booms because they don't have a pop filter. So, you wind up. Guys, people are having a hard time hearing me. Can you hush in the back? So. Thanks, guys. Sorry about that. So, sorry you were having a hard time hearing. So what you have is the first time that an organizational structure has emerged which is capable of feeding the people that are activists within it. What we have is an alternative institution which is making the people that are actors within it wealthy. And that has never happened before. The last time that happened was state communism where they made the communists wealthy by stealing other people's land. By stealing their industrial uh, production, by stealing their productive capacity. So we're now in a position where we have an alternative institution which is successful at feeding the people that are working for it. And that has never happened in a hundred years. It potentially has enormous legs. But what it means is the holders of wealth in other forms and the members of other participatory structures which have that property, for example, conventional state capitalism, are going to become increasingly threatened as Bitcoin scales. Right? Because you have an alternative institution which is completely continuous with the goals of the dim and distant now forgotten 60s, the radical decentralization, the ability to build non-state structures that work, you'll get identity management, you'll get property rights management, you'll get auction houses, you'll get all the rest of these kind of structures, escrow is already here. As that stuff builds out, what you have is a direct competitor with the state, which was always the anarcho-capitalist dream. It was always the libertarian dream. But, can you hold it? Right? As uh, Ben Franklin said, what do they have? They have a republic if they can hold it. And the ability to hold it comes back to the ability to govern. It's the ability to change and it's the ability to adapt. Even if the governance is completely decentralized swarm behavior, it's still governance because the swarm acts as a whole. And this is the critical challenge 
every time you succeed, you come into a new type of people that are threatened by your existence with a new set of techniques for shutting you down. So, as you begin to be a substantial alternative way of storing value, all of the other stores of value become threatened. All of the people that are storing assets in those stores of value become threatened, and this is how the pressure piles on. So, um, final piece of this, right? With power comes responsibility. So, as Bitcoin begins to put a real pressure on the world, and on the way that things operate, comes with that the responsibility of solving some of the problems that other actors are failing to solve. The two big problems that I worry about most are climate and the associated impacts that are you know, in the humanitarian sphere, and nanotechnology and biotechnology risk management, which is grey goo, it's designer plagues, it's basement bioweapons, it's all of that stuff. So what I really want to see emerge from this new thing which is happening is not just the counter economics. Counter economics is lovely, it's a great way for a limited number of people to go out there and do their thing. Great, fantastic. Counter economics will not do anything at all to stop six degrees of planetary warming and a drop of two billion people in the human population because of agriculture collapses. So, with great power comes great responsibility. How is this community of people that have built the first really successful alternative political institution since communism actually going to find a way of making sure the planet that they're living on continues to exist long enough for them to enjoy their success. Right? When we start talking about political consciousness, the state is just the last institution that had responsibility for solving the real problem. As you begin to outcompete the state in certain areas, you become responsible for solving the real problem. It's not just currency, it's not just freedom, it's survival. And until we begin to build a political rhetoric that absolutely acknowledges the real stakes of the human game that we play, the tactical and even the strategic success of Bitcoin will not turn into a better chance for the human race to survive. And these risks are real and acute. We must not get into a position where we have a tactical or a strategic success that fails to solve the real political problems we face. So, thank you. Slide. So, my main project is a thing called the Hexier project, which is an open hardware housing system. Uh, in a nutshell, those, the walls of these shelters are whole sheets of 4x8 or 1.2x2.4 meter material, and the roof pieces are half sheets. So, you can just take this material off a truck in huge quantities, cut half of it in half, screw or glue or tape it together, and produce emergency housing. Uh, these pictures were taken at Burning Man, and last year they built about 1,500 units. So this is kind of all the way at the other end of Maslow's hierarchy from Bitcoin. This is the basic mechanics for keeping people alive inside of a Libra complex. And there's a whole bunch of other work. Hexa yurt. Six-sided yurt. Uh, if I can get them to adjust the slide. Uh, other side of the slide. Can you move that over so we can see the big dome? I don't think there was there. Anyway, so uh, do we have time for questions? Yes, yes. Okay, right. Questions? Are we on the same page as Jack Fresco? Yay! Same page as Jack. Fresco. Jack Fresco. I don't know Jack Fresco. <clears throat> so, I don't know. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, other questions? Given that I don't know who Jack Fresco is, can I help you? Yeah! Can you um, talk us through your vision for your Hexia other than a city? Sure. So, uh, the question is, can I talk about the vision for the Hexia other than a burning man? Very basically, we've got to provide a decent standard of living for an additional 4 to 6 billion people over the next 50 years, or we're going to have endless resource wars. So, the long-term strategy for the Hexier is to take two thin sheets of aluminium like you use for a coke can, and then a honeycomb of cardboard in between, and fill the gap with shredded newspaper. 
machine seal the edges, and that gets you a three kilogram insulated panel, which costs on the order of 10 euros. And as long as you don't pierce the surface with a nail, the thing will last for on the order of 50 to 100 years before the glue fails. When that happens, rip the aluminium off and recycle it and mulch the cardboard. What that means is we can do super lightweight insulated housing out of enormously available materials for the entire world inside of a free market context. Very, very simple. Uh, and you could go up to these kind of domes here. That's all made with the same components as the little hexiarchs. You just build a slightly larger version uh, out of basically four of the roofs of the smaller units connected. So that gets you housing. Solar panels get you energy. Uh, dirt cheap telecommunications devices are already ubiquitous, no problem there. There are equivalent technological breakthroughs for water, for cooking, for sanitation, for agriculture. Uh, Safe Water Trust, One Acre Fund, um, the BioLite stove guys or any of the wood gasification stoves. What you wind up with is a system where you can buy everything that it takes for a family to live relatively well in a rural environment for only the order of $300, which is roughly equivalent to one year's income. And that system, if you implement it properly, will give people essentially first world lifespan because they will stop getting the vast majority of diseases that are waterborne, because they'll have some access to basic medical information, because they'll have decent infrastructure for the basics of staying alive. And the long-term vision is to create a safety buffer for the probability that we're going to continue to have a power law distribution in wealth, so we've got to figure out what we're going to do with the bottom half of humanity. They're not going to be able to get a foot on the ladder, they are not going to the stars, they are not going to get life extension treatment, so how exactly are we going to provide a decent standard of living for everybody without having to implement global socialism? And the answer is, you make the essentials that people need to stay alive so cheap that everybody can afford them, at which point you don't need to regulate how these things are provided anymore. They become as ubiquitous as pencils. Um, does that answer your question? Oh, and I should say that almost all of those technologies are fully public domain or the patents expired decades ago. You know, this is all Libra stuff. I'm not going to go back into a paper regime for this. Okay, uh, any more questions? Can you just share your, how uh, get hold of you? Oh, yeah, so uh, basically just find the Hexier. Uh, Vinay Gupta at the Hexier project. Just you know, look on the website, there's my Twitter, and there's my email and all the rest of that stuff. Uh, easy to find. Um, what about the water-powered uh, water engine? Water-powered engine. Uh, I've they killed the bloke who invented it. I've, I've never seen anything like that actually function. So... Cool. Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah? Self-education. Self-regulation. Okay. Hard question. Um, no, 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 no. Two minutes. Okay, self regulation. What is your thoughts on coin validation? What are your thoughts on coin validation? Coin validation, God. Talk about a hard question. Okay, so nobody really has done the deep political philosophical work on Bitcoin, right? Everybody kind of thinks that it slots neatly into an anarcho-capitalist or libertarian framework, but actually it's much more complicated than that because there is no strong property right for management of the system as a whole. And this is an absolutely critical thing, right? If Bitcoin was incorporated as a conventional company, there would be a property right that was sold and traded for the people that owned that company, and they would be responsible for making policy decisions, and you'd be operating inside of an AMCAP or a libertarian framework. <clears throat> the problem is that at the top level, Bitcoin is an anarchy. So you have a bunch of people who are working in an anarcho-capitalist trading structure that is administered as a non-state anarchy, and the impedance mismatch between anarcho-capitalism and state-style property rights and the actual anarchic nature of the Bitcoin enterprise is shockingly undiscussed. So what comes out of that is every time you get a question like coin validation and uh, you know the questions about what constitutes a failure of the system that requires central intervention to repair like the blockchain fork, you wind up with a whole bunch of people talking completely different languages about how to solve the problem. Because without a solid property right at the beginning, without an owner, it just doesn't work inside of a standard anarcho-capitalist model. And very few of the people involved in Bitcoin have any of the necessary skills to do governance in an anarchy. 
right? Libertarians do not understand how governance works in anarchy. It's a completely different model of how you get things done. So the real question about Bitcoin is libertarian or anarchist? Because anarcho-capitalism is really just uh, you know, a subset of libertarianism or the other way around, it doesn't matter. It is not the same as non-state anarchy, it is not the same as left anarchy, it's certainly not the same thing as classical anarchy. Rothbard be damned, right? So you get into a position where the community as a whole has to decide whether or not they're going to be libertarians and establish a strong property right that controls Bitcoin, or whether they're going to be anarchists and they're actually going to learn how to get good at decentralized governance, right? My assertion is this, if you go down the libertarian route, you're going to wind up owned by Morgan Stanley, right? Eventually, so much of the Bitcoin will be owned by hedge funds that they will wind up as the de facto masters of the universe and your system will wind up as just another commodity. And then there'll be a sea of altcoins that just continue to foam in the background and they're worth about 50 quid each, right? Or you can go down the anarchist route, grab the system by its hair, and figure out how to do governance. And I think, and I hate to say this, but I think you're either going to wind up having to have an identity architecture so you can do representative governance, or you're going to have to say one coin, one vote. But if you go down the route of going one coin, one vote, which is cryptographically pretty easy to manage, you're going to have huge problems if the hedge funds decide that they like Bitcoin. So this is really the challenge. I don't have any answers, but I think that people really seriously need to up the discussion about Bitcoin uh, in terms of political philosophy really, really several times very quickly. Because right now, you have a runaway success, which has greatly exceeded the capacity of people using it to govern it. And if you don't solve that problem pretty damn quick, failures of governance are going to end the utopia. So, you know, now is the time to go back to the anarchists. Uh, Herbert Snorrison in Iceland, anarchism.is, this guy called Herbert Snorrison, uh, you know, poke him until he tells you what to do. He's very smart. Thank you. Venus Project. Oh, okay. If they said Venus Project, I would know the name. I just didn't remember the name. 